Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this session of Art Protests with Kim Charmley and Greg Cholette. When we first started planning this session a few months back, the idea was to have Kim and Greg talk about one of the issues that hasn't really come up much in the series so far. That is the question of co-optation and appropriation by the radical right. We've learned a lot about the strategies and tactics of art protests from artists, activists, and scholars from around the world over the past two years, but always from the perspective of the fight for social justice, that is to say, um, uh, 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 from the left, which makes some sense uh, uh, because after all, most of the tactics and strategies we're talking about were first developed and deployed on the left. But it's hard to ignore the fact that the radical right has proven at least as adept in deploying them since the turn of the century. The turn, uh, the run up to the election of Donald Trump and to the Brexit vote in the UK demonstrate just how effective the use of shock, satire, and humor, Daytona Mo, and tactical media could be on the right. When the art and protest series started in 2020, the wave of protest above all Black Lives Matter seemed to drown all that out. But in planning season two, it seemed obvious, at least to me, that the climate had once again become more ambivalent, less exuberant, darker, and more uncertain as to the direction art and protest might take going forward. So a session on the radical right seemed to make sense. Then the world changed. Putin's war on Ukraine seems to dominate our vision of the present, and where that present is taking us both in the immediate and the long term. So the title Kim and Greg chose for this session whether art activism is a question that has attained even more urgency today. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers who will each present briefly before engaging in a dialogue that you're welcome to join in. Uh, Kim Charnley is lecturer in the art history department at the Open University in the UK. His research focuses on the history, theory, and practice of arts politics focusing especially on art activism, institutional critique, and socially engaged art. His work has been published in the journals Art and the Public Sphere, Historical Materialism, Field, and The Large Glass, a monograph exploring the role of the collective in, contemporaries art, art, in contemporary arts politics entitled Sociopolitical Aesthetics, Art Crisis, uh, Neoliberalism was published by Bloomsbury 2021. Kim is a member of the collective Beyond the Now, which is a platform for exploring the place of social practice art in the post-pandemic world. Gregory Cholette is a New York-based artist, writer, teacher, and activist whose forthcoming book, The Art of Activism and the Activism of Art, Lund Humphreys, joins dark matter, delirium and resistance, and art as social activism to focus on issues of collective cultural labor, activist art, and counter historical representation. He is co-founder of several political art collectives, holds a PhD from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, uh, is a graduate of the Whitney Independent Studies Program in Critical Theory, and co-directs with Chloe Bass, uh, Abbas, Social Practice CUNY, SB CUNY, uh, funded by the Andrew Mellon uh, Foundation at the Graduate Center, uh, City University of New York. Before turning things over to our speakers, I just want to encourage you all to please ask questions, but to put those questions in the Q&A and not the chat. We'll get to as many of those as possible uh, as the conversation moves forward. So with that, um, take it away. Uh, I, Kim, are you going first? I don't know. Kim is first. Yeah, I think I'm first. So thank you so much, Kevin. That's really, really kind of you to, to invite me to talk here. I'm going to share my screen uh, first of all. Um, hang on a second. Let's hope this works. It did a minute ago. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay, that's not from the yeah we got it okay great okay right so i'm i'm to start with i'm gonna say a few just kind of put out there a few a few um thoughts uh framing 
framing the kind of uh, discussion or framing some ideas that might feed into the discussion, but I think it can go in a few different directions. Um, and I hope that, you know, that, that what these prompts are, what I'm, what I'm providing are prompts that will hopefully um, allow for things to be teased out in, in, in questions. Okay, so art activism, I would say, is a hybrid phenomenon, and it can be approached from two different directions, from the side of art or from the side of politics. So, so what I'm going to talk about here approaches art activism mainly from the side of art before arriving at some points that have political implications. Um, it's not a definitive interpretation, uh, but an attempt to, to kind of explore a complex situation, as, as Kevin was alluding to. And especially here, I'm just going to try and situate art activism within some changes in the social organization of art that, that have taken place over the 50 year, years, last 50 years or so, and especially since the turn of the millennium. And uh, as Kevin mentioned, some of these ideas are, are in this book here that, um, that, that came out last year. Okay, so I'm going to start with a, a kind of a classic uh, source. Um, in 1984, the essay Trojan Horses, Activist Art and Power by Lucy R. Lippard surveyed the diverse art activist scene of that moment, uh, also known at the time as the Movement for Cultural Democracy. And this is one of the first texts, I think, as far as I've been able to find, that was to try to address art activism as a coherent, if contradictory, development, which had its origins in arts-based activism of the late 60s. And to evoke the peculiar tensions involved in activist art, uh, Lippard uses the image of the Trojan horse, as you can see here. So based in subversion on the one hand and empowerment on the other, activist art works both within and beyond the beleaguered fortress that is high culture or the art world. So in 1984, when this was written, Lippard represented activist art as an insurgent um, force of a kind in an apparently apolitical mainstream of the art world. And we can get into the complexities of what apolitical means there, but, but this is the kind of mise-en-scene of, of, of that text. And at the time, art activists focus on participation, collective working, seem to demythologize art to disrupt, quote, its specialized lesson in beauty or ideology coming from the top down, as Lippard put it. So that was 1984, but flicking forward to closer to the present, we can see now that the situation is, is very different. Collectives have become well-established as winners of mainstream art prizes in the UK, whereas they, were, they were certainly weren't that in the 1980s, although they were beginning to gain some more kind of visibility. This, this sort of development where, for example, um, this is from the Turner Prize in 2019, the, the four nominees, Tai Shani, Helen Kamek, Oscar Murillo, and Lawrence Abu Hamdan, formed a collective um, you know, in order not to have the award go to any one individual. And you know, besides that, um, we can see that in 2021, which was the next iteration, 2020 was cancelled, um, the, 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 all the nominees were actually collectives and, and the winner was um, a Ray collective, a Belfast based kind of socially engaged art collective. So this just is kind of one example of many that I'm sure that many of you listeners, uh, people, people kind of attending will, will know of at the moment of collectives who've achieved enormous prominence, uh, especially more recently. But this phenomenon has been recognized since around the turn of the millennium. Um, at, at that time, more collectives began to achieve mainstream recognition, more activist and politically engaged art achieved exposure in large scale biennials like Documentary 11 in 2002. Writing at the time, <clears throat> the activist critic Brian Holmes, in an influential essay called Liar's Poker, hypothesized that the rise of collectives was a sign of, of the incorporation of some forms of artistic critique into a new spirit of capitalism, drawing on the work of sociologists Luke Boltensky and Eve Chiapello. And that became a familiar way of explaining this kind of uh, this change in the status of politicized art. Uh, and is, you know, th those, that source is wide, widely kind of quoted since. Um, 
and I'm the um, but at the same time, Holmes recognized that the real political stakes were being introduced into the art institution at that time, and that maybe, just maybe, the nature of that institution might change as a result. So I'm just going to flick. I've gone back. I've, uh, my slides are out of order. I apologize. So Brian Holmes was kind of writing at a time at the turn of uh, turn of the millennium when when art activism was 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 often kind of aligned with a kind of ultra globalization movement um was kind of channeling some of the energy of that into a kind of an art space and and there was kind of alternative hypotheses about how how that political energy might might relate to art on the one hand there was a kind of a, an idea about exit about the, the need to kind of move outside of of the kind of art institution and to embed in embed art in politics but on the flip side, as you can see from this quote from another Brian Holmes text, there is the idea of kind of occupying that space of communication that is provided by art in order to in order to politicize it even further, as, as you can see there. And as I said, it certainly seems like this is something that kind of actually has happened um, to a great to a great extent. It's interesting to, to contrast Lippard's metaphor of the Trojan horse to a more recent use of the same metaphor. So this is a 2020 protest by Art Not Oil against sponsorship of a British museum exhibition by the Petrochemical Corporation, BP. And at that time, uh, a participant sort of put it this way or explained what they were doing. You can see this is a kind of a, a kind of a, 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 an intervention that this group engaged in. Sorry. So the Troy exhibition has inspired us to create this magnificent beast, the Trojan horse, because the Trojan horse is the perfect metaphor for BP sponsorship. On its surface, the sponsorship looks like uh, a, a generous gift, but inside lurks death and destruction. So <clears throat> obviously metaphors are always liable to being turned this way and that and put to various rhetorical uses. In this case, though, the altered terms of the metaphor between 1984 and 2020 seem to speak to a dramatically altered social context for art. In this version, the subversion of higher culture comes from various agents, including corporations, oligarchs, states who have learned to use art as a tool of soft power. The methods of art activism have become more prevalent in part because they resist the instrumentalization of art in a global order that has become increasingly unequal. And nowadays, it's common knowledge that culture is a battleground. You know, it's a sharp, the sharp kind of political contestation is, 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 is seen uh, within art much more, I would argue, much more, much more sharply than it, than, than it has done uh, hitherto. So, um, Obviously, culture wars was also a feature of the late 1980s and early 1990s, but the terrain on which this culture war plays out is now quite different. The early 1990s was a moment when the end of the Cold War saw a triumphant liberal democracy promising a new global consensus. Now there's a crisis of the legitimacy of economic globalization that was supposed to bring liberal democracy to the whole planet. So this changed context has affected the social organization of the art institution and its character. At the same time as artists now point to histories of exploitation, present day oppression that are legitimized by the business of, as usual of cultural institutions, um, others use legal and political means to silence them. This is a, a current uh, or a recent example which uh, um, has been in the press in the UK. Uh, Forensic Architecture, a collective who were nominated for the Turner Prize in 2018. Uh, a recent a project of theirs called Closed Cloud Studies, which was exhibited in Manchester, the Whitworth Gallery in 2021, which is a kind of, you know, focusing on questions to do with air quality um, and kind of uh, the relationship between environmental justice and kind of racial discrimination. Um, which they accompanied with this statement in support of Palestine um, in 2021. Um, 
and this it, it resulted in a um, uh, a campaign by uh, an organisation called UK Lawyers for Israel, who complained of its inflammatory language, and asked for it to be removed. There was a standoff around this between between uh, Manchester. Uh, the owner of the gallery, or the, the, the kind of um, which is uh, Manchester University, um, but the upshot of it is that the gallery director was asked to leave by uh, leave his post as a way as a result of the way this was this 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 played out, and and it's an example of uh, of a kind of a much more widespread phenomenon at the moment in the UK, which is to do with. Um, attempts which are which are kind of supported by the government to kind of um, to criminalize protest or to kind of chill uh, dissent to you know to kind of uh, increase the risks involved in any kind of criticism uh, that kind of is seen to breach um, uh, sort of kind of uh, narrowly defined norms of what of 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 what counts as kind of free speech narrowly narrowly uh, being a kind of understatement so at the moment the uk government is trying to push through legislation aiming at criminalizing protest uh the police crime and sentencing a court bill largely in response to things like uh just to, to, to events including in, in 2020 um the removal of the colston memorial uh, sorry the colston statue in bristol uh colston of course uh, famously a slaver and 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 quite rightly caused the the, the fact that he's commemorated in in a multiracial city was seen as uh you know an affront for many many years eventually people took it into their own hands to remove it and uh, uh, on a positive note, the the four uh, protesters who were actually prosecuted for this were actually acquitted, um, you know, against the desires of the of the government of, of of the current conservative government. So, from the inception of what, so just to conclude, this kind of these prefatory pref excuse me, these kind of opening kind of remarks. From the inception of Western modernity, art has been associated with democratic ideals of freedom and equality. In practice, of course, the liberal democratic order, the political order, has always fallen short of those ideals, founded as it is on slavery, and economic exploitation, colonialism. Art has often highlighted those shortcomings, but it also incorporated itself into the status quo. As a result, many argued that it became a kind of safety valve of liberal democracy, because art seems to model a consensual public made of individual subjects where critical currents were accommodated so as to be neutralized. I would argue that now it's harder to see art operating in this way because of this sharper kind of political edge to all of these kind of um, these examples of kind of, um, of of politics becoming more salient um, within 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 the kind of high cultural space. Activist collectives are celebrated also in the mainstream of contemporary art. And high culture is incorporated at the same time into image management strategies of corporate bodies and oligarchs and economic strategies of municipal and national governments. So there seems then to be a crisis in the institution of art and that the prominence of our activism has something to do with this crisis. So the question is, how should we understand this situation, bearing in mind what Kevin said just now about this sense that we're kind of opening out on a different kind of situation historically which which it would be vain to try and kind of predict what's going to happen um you know because of the geopolitical instability that we we're currently seeing so i'm going to just advance a couple of hypotheses that i think are kind of out there in the way that kind of our activists are and, and politically engaged artists are actually responding to this sort of situation so the first hypothesis is that our institution, the art institution, is doing what it has always done. It accommodates radical politics in order to neutralize them. And that's why, you know, that's one way of, see, of, of explaining why it is that kind of our activism now has the prominence it does. Meanwhile, high art continues to lend legitimacy to forms of oppression driven by a profoundly exploitative capitalist order. <clears throat> 
And the challenge then from this perspective is to further radicalize our activism so that it communicates a message that can't easily be assimilated and to direct attention to violence that is the precondition for art's exalted status. And, and I would argue that's, that's how I'm reading something like Strike MoMA, which we can talk a bit about perhaps uh, when we kind of get onto the kind of questions, which is a, a, a current activist kind of campaign, campaign uh, directed obviously against the Museum of Modern Art. Um, okay, so that's one way of trying to interpret what's going on now. Second hypothesis, slightly different. I'm not saying that these two hypotheses are mutually exclusive, but I think they're different and, and, and that's why I'm kind of posing them separately. Art is increasingly politicized because the political order in which it's embedded has become disarticulated and fractured. The art institution is no longer coherent. It functions sometimes as a space for critical dialogue, others an instrument of soft power, sometimes to promote financial speculation in an increasingly unstable geopolitical context. So in some places, art is subject to censorship, and yet others it continues to promote left liberal ideas while under pressure from conservative politicians. In others, art infrastructure is destroyed and artists displace, displaced. And this general disorder means that the politics of art are more localized, but also more concrete than, than perhaps they have been hitherto. Okay, so I'm not gonna say any more about this now, except just to say I've, briefly that um, I've placed up there just to kind of, a, as an example, an arts and uncertainty toolkit, which is uh, a really interesting um, kind of um, project associated with uh, uh, an organization called Eti Jihad Independent Culture, which is an organization that works with uh, Syrian dis diaspora um, artists and, and in relation to kind of Syrian uh, promotion of kind of Syrian culture. Um, and it was devised by a, a very interesting kind of artist and facilitator producer called uh, Rana Yaz, uh, Yaz, Yazigi. Um, which I would recommend anyone to have a look at just to kind of see as a kind of, uh, I think, an interesting kind of approach to considering and, uh, and engaging with the uncertainty, the geopolitical uncertainty that we now see. So I apologize if I've run over slightly there, but I'm going to leave it and hand over to Greg. Thanks so much, Kim. That was, that was amazing. Maybe, uh, Kevin, you could put that link in the uh, chat for everybody of the, of the project you were just talking about, Kim, uh, the Uncertainty Project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just tack off of um, pretty much what Kim is saying. And we didn't coordinate this, but it'll, it might seem like we did. Uh, <laughs> let me just get this started. And screen is full screen now. Yes, good. Yes, that's that's working. I'm going to start with just a couple of quotes. And this is really coming out of my new book that Kevin mentioned called uh, The Art of Activism and the Activism of Art. Um, and I start with this quote by Martha Rosler. Uh, Artistic imagination continues to dream of historical agency. And I'll try to explain why I start with that. But there are a few others I want to look at, including, uh, hang on, there we go, uh, Boris Groys who's insisted that the phenomenon of art activism is central to our time because it is a new phenomenon. And it's different from the phenomenon of critical art because it's, uh, which has become a familiar in recent decades. And I, he goes on to say that's because art activists today don't wanna to stop being artists. And we can talk about what that means in a second. And then Kim Charnley himself, uh, art functions as a glitch within art history that threatens to invert the figure and ground of the narrative. And I think his presentation really started to dig into some of the logic that he had behind that. But really just um, paralleling him, I came across this website from the Tate, which literally is a quiz that you can take online, which art collective do you, do you belong to? It asks you questions uh, and then it gives you an answer. It's like one of those things that you you know, strange creatures you find in some sort of like uh, carnival that spits out a little uh, scroll and you unravel it and there you are, here's your future. So um, I can try to find that link too in a minute and put it out there in case you wanna try it. What was remarkable though, besides just the idea that there would be this quiz, uh, 
Um, and uh, okay, one other thing is also that Art Review, and this is now 2020, a couple of years ago, had Black Lives Matter as its top art influencer. There's a British uh, journal, some of you may know, and Me Too as number four. And back to the Tate again, when you scroll down the page from this quiz, you can discover more radical art groups. And they have, of course, different groups. Some of them are very well, well known by now, I think, certainly by people that are listening here, Art Workers Coalition, High Red Center from Japan, Guerrilla Girls. Um, what I want to talk about is the fact that as this website, because I checked the data on it, was being constructed and uploaded, uh, the people, many people at the, on the staff at the table were outside striking against the museum because they were trying to shut down many of the jobs at the museum during the COVID lockdown. So I found it incredibly interesting, and this, this comes back to what Kim was saying, is that while the museum wants to sort of uh, incorporate this idea of radicality, it does so in a way that always kind of teeters on the possibility of some kind of rupture. And so I imagined what would happen if all these groups that they were pointing back to in time just decided to leave the website. And this is the result. But we're talking about groups like Guerrilla Art Action Group, uh, who did a die-in at the MoMA uh, on, the on the left here, which where they sort of splattered themselves with fake blood at a precise moment and threw uh, flyers out talking about uh, people that the museum and people in line waiting for the museum to get tickets should be opposed to the Vietnam War. More recently, the confrontation over Warren Candors at the Whitney Museum here. Candors, you may recall, had a company, uh, it still has a company, I'm sure, that makes so-called non-lethal weapons, including uh, gas, uh, tear gas, and other kinds of uh, gases that you throw at protesters. And these were being used in Gaza, and they were being used on our border against people from Central America trying to come in and get sanctuary. Uh, Laurie Joe Reynolds, who did an extensive project over many years to try to end a high security prison, the, the really cruel and inhuman way prisoners were being treated in Illinois. Here's a mud stencil. I really love this idea. So it's like something that is temporary and creates a really graphic uh, image on the ground. Or again, the, the, the recent wave of uh, strikes and unionization movements that have taken place. The unionization is happening mostly across the United States. Uh, I haven't heard of anything yet outside the US. Maybe someone can enlighten me on that. But here we actually have the cleaners at Bill Bow uh, going on a kind of temporary strike to protest their working conditions. Or uh, this uh, fellow who is in fact a Congolese activist and not an artist. And yet when you really think about what he's doing, it's so close to a kind of interventionist activism. It's really hard to slip a piece of paper between the two ideas. Here he is, uh, he's Congolese, he's going in, he's taking an African artifact out of a museum in, Par in Paris and walking out with it, obviously not intending to actually steal it, but being confronted by uh, some of the employees and getting to talk about why he's doing this, which is of course the theft of so many African artifacts that are now in Western museums. Uh, Black Lives Matters, uh, sort of Black Lives Matter, sort of really kind of in, in invigorating a whole mass movement, as we recall from just about a year and a half ago, uh, after the, uh, the 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 death of uh, George Floyd in particular. But here we have actually Eric Garner, who was also killed by police, on uh, mo mobile panels leading a march by a guy named JR. And I'll try to make tie up why I'm pre presenting these. Damon Davis, a piece in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, where an, a, another uh, person was killed, Michael. Uh, and uh, Cali, Col Columbia, uh, a temporary monument to freedom, to, to, to liberation against the, uh, the repressive regime there. The, the removal of monuments. This one was targeted by the group decolonized this place among many others as, as well as back in the 70s by the American Indian movement, a radical left movement. And finally, it's being removed from in front of the Museum of Natural History here in New York. This was a Teddy Roosevelt Memorial. And if you Google and look up the memorial, you'll see immediately why people wanted to have this removed from in front of the building. Native American people here are celebrating the fact that the uh, Dakota pipeline was going to be nixed by uh, the current president, not the last president, uh, President Biden, is celebrating. What I want to point to is the aesthetic uh, 
nature of all these demonstrations, the very, very much ingrained within what's going on, the graphics, the visuals, the portable art, the performative nature of it here, Black Monday women's rights demonstrations in Warsaw. Uh, here, one from just about a week ago, a Polish and Ukrainian artists in Warsaw as well, uh, carrying works that really reference back to the 1930s constructivist movement in that country, in that country by Straminsky, and um, using in, uh, the colors of the Ukrainian flag. Or Dred Scott, uh, who was the last speaker, I believe, or maybe that maybe it was two speakers back. Uh, Kevin, you can correct me. Uh, who did this NFT? You know, the NFT, which we could also talk a little bit about if we have time, uh, seems like a completely um, problematic uh, kind of new art form, let's say. And yet Scott found a way to sort of turn it into uh, a radical political statement by auctioning off the image of a white person as if uh, to, to sort of date back and like refer back to the time when uh, African and Americans, black people, Africans were uh, fungible assets, right? They had numbers assigned to them because of the quality of the kind of work they did and they were interchangeable as uh, objects to be sold, NFT, right? But going back to a group that I was a co-founder of, and Kevin made a comment that I co-founded several groups, which is true, um, Political Art Documentation Distribution, which now has its archives at MoMA. We did street stencils, and sort of just to get a feel for sort of the emergence of the kind of activist art that Kim was talking about as well. This is now in the early 80s, coming out of the 70s, which I see as sort of the critical turning point for a lot of this kind of activist art. Um, or artists call, and I ask you uh, to also Google this if you have a chance, uh, Art for the Future, which is a really terrific exhibition uh, that I've only seen images of so far, I'm going there in a couple of weeks, it's in Boston at Tufts University, but it reconstructs uh, aspects of Artists Call, which was a 1984 omnibus exhibition that was basically trying to uh, garner cultural support to oppose Ronald Reagan's uh, what seemed to be imminent intervention in uh, Nicaragua, in El Salvador, possibly Honduras at the time. And so I call your attention to that. You can see the poster was by Klaus Oldenburg and it's lots and lots of little detailed lines. Well, those are all of many galleries and artists that were involved in this enormous exhibition. I don't think there's been anything like that since then anywhere in the world that I know of. It's quite remarkable. And I just wanna end on a couple of images this one I just got off the Twitter feed recently, and the group of artists there said that I, you know, I, I can happily use this in my book, and I squeezed it into the book just as we were finishing the proof. Um, this is an artist group in northern Kiev who are welding together what looks like a kind of minimalist sculpture, but it's an anti-tank barricade, and they're also doing uh, other kinds of, uh, you know, defense systems with their art technology and their art techniques. And just to sort of end on my um, reconsideration of John Hartfield, now updated with uh, Vladimir Putin instead of uh, Adolf, of course. So just to say a couple of things, uh, and, I'll, and then I'll turn, uh, we'll get into the discussion real quick. This idea of the, um, the sort of Trojan horse, I think is sort of really interesting just as a kind of motif. And in fact, the other day, uh, my wife Olga was talking with Kuba Schrader from, from Warsaw. I don't know if he's listening now. He suddenly had to get off because his uh, email was attacked by a Russian Trojan horse and it was duplicating all kinds of stuff all over his email. Um, we haven't heard from him since. Hopefully little green men didn't jump out of his computer as well. But this idea that one could sort of, you know, slide into the institution and uh, open up sort of a different kind of rating of the institution is really sort of key, I think, to this idea of the Trojan horse that Lucy was putting forward. But now I think you're right, uh, Kim, that we're in this kind of complicated moment when uh, we see some of the same exact techniques being used by the far right. And I'll just make one comment maybe to get the ball rolling in a more of a discussion sort of direction. In my sort of approach to it, I looked at the January 6th events in, 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 the, in the new book that's, that's going to be published. And I think I have a oh, picture of it too, which I'll put up. In this. Um, and really sort of realized that um, what, I, what I sort of like really thought about it and tried to compare it 
to the, um, just to sort of plug my book as, you know, uh, when I tried to compare it to like sort of left, what occurred to me was that in so many ways, the, the, uh, the left opens up an archive of the past, which I sometimes refer to as a phantom archive, just a kind of jagged archive of all kinds of materials, which is why I like your comment about the glitch that art has, that, that art activism, it's, it's not something that you can kind of linearize, you know, it doesn't work in that way. And there's no school, you know, there's no formal technique like cubism or something you could point to. Uh, there's just so many ways that it sort of rises up, does something and then sort of vanishes, even though I think at this moment it seems to be kind of refusing to vanish, which I find fascinating. But it's not really linear. It is kind of a strange mixed dark matter archive, a glitchy fragmented archive. And when left, I think artists and cultural people dig into that archive, they often repurpose active aspects of it, often unknowingly that they didn't know Art Workers Coalition maybe was doing this, that, or the other thing, or Guerrilla Art Action Group or whatever. Um, but they repurpose it sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, but in a way that sort of seems to kind of open a space towards other possibilities, towards recreating other sorts of appropriations or repurposings or pointing to some aspect in some time in the future when indeed the museum would really become this kind of de democratic space, this kind of different kind of space. Um, what I think I've read from the January 6th, and we could talk about this, is there's a tendency there to go back to the past as well, but it's a frozen past. It's a mythologized past. It's, it's a, a religious, religiousized past. It's a white supremacist past. And their image of it is almost always completely incorrect. And it's also sort of mediated through cultural forms that, you know, uh, heroicize uh, these things, uh, whether it's, you know, Hollywood cinema or whatever it is, uh, in a way that really kind of uh, objectifies it, reifies it, and doesn't open up a space for a future that is different, pointing in a different direction, but very much profoundly sort of leaping back in time and driving us into uh, the hands of something that's already sort of uh, existed, namely fascism. So those are just a couple of quick thoughts um, over to you. Thanks, Greg. Um, Kevin, have we got time to just kind of, I think I may have overrun a little bit at the beginning. So I, are we okay to kind of just get, get started with a, a bit of a back and forth on this or? Yeah, no, I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll be interested in that. We have some questions starting to uh, come to the queue, but why don't you, uh, I'd really like to hear the two of you. Yeah, sure. Do you talk about this? And um, I mean, I also have questions of my own that I, I mean, just the the, the the thing that Greg brought up just now about the, the how the right uses art or um, uh, aesthetics and that sort of thing. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, it kind of goes to um, some of the more historical aspects of the, that you raised also, and you raised in your book about yeah where all this is coming from and how, I mean, we may sh maybe shouldn't be that surprised that, but people always are. I used to teach modernism at Yale and um, that the fact that in the 20s and 30s, you know, um, political engagement of the avant-garde was very much on both sides and mm -hmm. not, not just on, uh, on, on the left. Um, and that that is something that I think, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to think about, but anyway, um, uh, I, I really want to be a listener here more than anything. No, no problem. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I agree with that. And, and, and of course, you know, I agree with everything you said there, Greg, about the character of the, the types of the, the types of kind of meanings that are shared um, by by the, the kind of radical right and so on, or the, the kinds of uh, the kinds of world that they 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 aspire to, uh, kind of kind of represent, and I think that the, the one thing I would kind of uh, kind of yeah to tease out of that is 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 going to what kind of um, <clears throat> Kevin said there. You know, I think that we you know it's it, we are in a in a, in a politicized situation, so that 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 this is what happens. You know, you get these kinds of um, uh, uh, rallying points. And I think you, if you look at kind of into the history of modernism, looking, looking, you know, kind of even to any any moment of kind of uh, of kind of significant kind of crisis, you get that kind of um, oppositional kind of 
stuff going on around different kinds of symbols. And I think that I see it uh, as kind of being, um, first of all, a kind of an, an example of that kind of, uh, that kind of, that kind of social and political kind of phenomenon that we're seeing it's unstable you know we're in an unstable sort of situation and and in because of that um there is this kind of flux in which um in which we find things that were that were once kind of or kind of signs visual signs uh different kinds of um ideas that seemed once to be kind of just latently you know just kind of floating around there and not doing very much being kind of uh turned into rallying points in the way you just described greg and i think that um you know that, that that's kind of one of the things that's going on the other thing is as i said in in, in the kind of opening statements is that the kind of I and mean, this is sketched and this is a complex situation i'm not saying that i kind of um I'm not trying to say that i kind of know uh, know the kind of secret of the conjuncture but it does seem to be the case that for, to me anyway that what we're seeing is a is a legitimacy crisis for liberal democracy because of the kind of many different kinds of uh, economic well because of polarization the kind of economic situation and um, there's a lot of discontent out there and um and also you know in the midst of that, as we've seen during COVID, and uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people getting kind of information that is kind of, you know, they 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 don't have a way to 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 kind of check it. They don't have a way to kind of contextualize it, and and people go down down kind of rabbit holes with that. You know, that that as we know, it are kind of the, that kind of that kind of dynamic is also uh, favors fascism too. So we've got all those kinds of things kind of going on at the same time, right? And I'm sure, I'm sure that's something you're going to, you know, I'm sure that's what you're teasing out in the book. And it's great to have the January the sixth kind of in there. Uh, I think in order to, it, just to go back to some of your kind of previous work, Greg, what I, what always struck me and I found really interesting about your book Dark Matter is the way you even back in 2010 when you were writing i think it was 2010 maybe even a little bit earlier you were kind of talking about the kind of dark matter coming into light as not necessarily being a progressive thing that there was a lot of resentment that is kind of you know in there the kind of that that was itself finding its kind of outlets through through the internet through people finding each other and you know even back then that's something you were kind of writing about and i think that that that's to me and that's why that book that you wrote was kind of a bit of a touchstone for me to trying to think well what does what's going on in this kind of situation you know it's it, and its instability yeah i think that's that's yeah i mean definitely i i wrote just a part of one chapter on this idea of like the negative implications of dark matter getting brighter and i actually wanted to have an entire chapter uh, on the tea party but just didn't have the time or the resources to do the to do the research unfortunately i'm I'm, I'm, I teach as an art uh, artist, and, and I don't have the art historian's uh, tools at my disposal, generally speaking, but that was uh, an, an ambition. But um, just to sort of kind of swing back a bit from what we're talking about, someone put an interesting question in, someone named PH, uh, about the idea of fake news. And I think this ties in very much with what we're talking about here. You know, does the idea of fake news actually kind of evolve out of the way let's say the left used um, this kind of tactical media to express uh, critique. And I think maybe the person is thinking of, or I'll throw this out, the yes men with their famous identity correction techniques, right? So they would imp you know, impersonate literally like a, a, a corporate person from a specific corporation, let's say, in order to expose the corporation's problematic uh, politics and, and, and anti-socialism ultimately, right? But one thing that's very different about um, what the Yes Men was doing, and I think Blake Stimson actually called my attention to this years ago, is the idea of the Dino Monk. There's a moment when the Yes Men are exposed. In fact, it's necessary for that kind of critique that they are exposed as fakes. Otherwise, it, you, you don't, it doesn't really work. And of course, when they did the famous Bhopal intervention with the BBC, it was after the, the, uh, the Dow Chemical got on to the BBC and said, 
those aren't people we know. They have nothing to do with us. You know, uh, the stock had actually plummeted somewhat because of what th this intervention. And you can look up the intervention. I don't think we have time to get into it. Um, that's the precise of the moment when that kind of intervention works. Of course, the other side of it is the idea of over identification, something that Slavoj Zizek has, has talked about extensively with the uh, with relationship to uh, NSK and in the former Yugoslavia. Um, but even there, you get. Uh, with NSK, in many cases, you get a, a kind of imagery that's so clearly overloaded with, you know, strange references that you might actually begin to believe that this really is some kind of like fascist or even socialist or whatever sort of imagery. But it's almost like you really have to be sort of gullible. Although I would say, and I think that the, the, the person who wrote this is, is onto something, we're, we're pulling from the same bag of tricks, really. And it doesn't start really with the left uh, in the 1960s or 70s with the counterculture. I think it, it can go all the way back to certainly uh, Ge Goebbels, uh, appropriately enough, right? Who's pulling the, the, uh, the beard over Karl Marx in the famous Hartfield piece to try to convince workers that uh, Hitler is, uh, uh, I mean, pulling a Karl Marx beard over Hitler, trying to convince the workers that Hitler's on their side. And I'm sure you can go all the way back to the, to the Trojan horse, really. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. I, I guess one of the things that, you know, I mean, amazes me, I mean, Stephen Duncombe talks about this in, in his books um, as well. He, he was also on the program uh, last year, but, um, but just you know how uh, effective um, prior to 2016, leading up to 2016, the younger generation of of uh, social media kind of personalities were in in really capturing a lot of the use of irony and wit and humor um, and channeling it uh, into into Trump's camp. I you know after after um, January 6, I spent a lot of time reading about social media, trying to understand that. Uh, myself because I don't personally, I, I, I kind of keep like to keep my distance from social media, but um, but I was really astonished just at how sophisticated a lot of of what was being done was at that time. And, you know, um, I guess that's something else that that I you know um, there you know I think um, isn't it called Kill All Normies is one of the books that's been yes. written about this. Um, that <laughs> argues that really it's the it's an avant-gardist approach that is is being used here on the on the um, on the right. So it's yeah, it's kind of. But even there, Kevin, we have precedent with Marinetti and, and the, you know, <laughs> yeah, the futurists, and you know, um, so it, I don't, it's not there's no clean you know you can't put the 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 uh, knife into the into the cake and it's not going to come out clean and there's no way that's going to happen. Uh, the avant-garde is is itself very complex in its relationship to colonialism uh, and to and to the far right in many cases. Uh, but someone has a, a question. Maybe we can t connect back to something. Terry Marsh asks about museums wrestling with these kind of moral dilemmas over taking money and so on and so forth. I wonder if we could sort of think about that in relationship to your two hypotheses, uh, Kim, uh, this idea of the neutralization of uh, you know, radical art by the museum, uh, leaving us few options, except maybe like a strike art type approach, which I can tell you the people at MoMA have been extremely sort of anxious about uh, that particular thing. And of course, this knifing that happened must have just set them really on edge. Um, you know, and no one wants to see that kind of uh, violence, obviously, anywhere, let alone a museum. Or the second hypothesis that art reflects the fracturing of the political order. And in a way, it brings it, if it goes into the museum, it brings that into the museum context. And I think you're right. Those are like, those are, it's a really great sort of summation. And they are kind of like, compatible and they're sort of not compatible at the same time, right? How do yeah. museums how do museums uh, really deal with this stuff? Sure. I mean I think that yeah and Terry's question is a really, really good one. And I don't and that's why I put them as hypotheses because I think they're kind of out there maybe, you know, it, 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 you know, to as as possible kind of ways that people are working. And I I think that the you know for example, Strykar, if I read their kind of um, their kind of uh, program for, of action, I, I agree with everything that they're saying. So I'm not going to kind of criticize the kind of um, the the 
the kind of political kind of program is 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 very clear it's kind of powerful um and it's got a kind of um uh interesting um kind of extremism to it like an impossible demand right so it's kind of putting forward something as i tried to say that's not assimilable you know, it's not by the, by the, by the institution or that's what it seems to be the case and of course moma has only recently done its rehang and and kind of you know apparently tried to kind of address its history as a you know as a kind of one of the kind of centerpieces of a particular kind of uh kind of kind of idea of modernism or of art and yet they're kind of now being pushed to kind of address a kind of more kind of uh, uh, you know a, 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 a more radical kind of agenda i it's in answer to Terry's question, I am not sure what what museums can do in relationship to that. And my only thought, I suppose, and the reason I put the other hypothesis in there is because, you know, is there a, cent a central organizing force of the art institution, which is kind of like how MoMA is represented by stroke, strike MoMA, you know, that it's kind of the, the kind of the, the, the kind of the center of this citadel um that is that is kind of that they're trying to kind of um trying to to kind of challenge head on and and you know i don't i don't think there is you know i think that there is a kind of a fractured sort of situation our activism has always done kind of maybe two things it's always been really socially embedded and kind of you know in its kind of purview it's kind of engaged in kind of uh ground level kind of conditions but at the same time it's always kind of had elements that were trying to kind of build something bigger from that you know build some to make some kind of wider appeal and i think that maybe strike mama is kind of taking uh, mama is taking that kind of side you know they're trying to kind of say look this is about social we're about kind of trying to replace one idea of art with another idea of art right an idea of art that is about kind of um about kind of solidarity and kind of social engagement all those sorts of things um, and i think that that works as a kind of uh, as a kind of a uh, a challenge um it works also to kind of perhaps to kind of broadcast or kind of raise awareness of of some of the kind of political the, the, the some of the kind of injustices that social injustices that are actually taking place right now where it goes from now i'm not sure you know and that's the kind of wider kind of question about you know where do we situate a kind of uh the wider political kind of situation as we move into this this more multipolar world you know where as we've seen you know with with the kind of invasion of ukraine it's kind of it's kind of upend an awful lot of stuff it's already doing that I, I think i've already lost a few friends over over this to be honest with you um and, it, and it's, it's it's a very difficult discussion we've had a number of them with people in ukraine they're still in ukraine and our russian friends are under attack by ukrainians even though they're trying to protest the the, th the movement and trying to protest putin it's very complex um but yeah i think I, just to go back to MoMA for one second because neither of us really work in museums proper i did briefly work as a the uh, curator of education at New Museum, which is a story unto itself until I was fired. But um, what I could say about the moment is that it is um, it is fractured. That you're absolutely right. You know there are layers of politics within it, and certainly always it seems like the archive people or the library people, maybe the prints and the graphics people, have always had a sort of tendency towards you know embracing a more let's say a critical. Uh, point of view. And Deborah Wai, who's now retired, did this exhibition in 1988 called Committed to Print, where she actually put all this kind of artwork up on the wall, which, we, which has never been seen again in the museum, really, in the same way, which included posters, graphics, anti-war, anti-capitalist, etc. And the wonderful Hilton Kramer protege of uh, you know, Clement Greenberg in the New York Times, or he actually was in the New York Observer, said echoes of Stalinist past, you know, the bad taste of the 30s, blah, blah, blah. So it, it hit the mark. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to realize, even though there are these kind of layers and movements inside, there still is an asymmet asymmetry in the power structure. And at the end of the day, it's certain people like Glenn Lowry at the top of the structure who really get to call the shots and make the final decisions. And uh, I, I don't have time to tell you uh, another story about PADD re that 
came up just in the last few years, but it's really clear that, you know, what gets through the filter has to ultimately kind of get through that top layer. I did put strike art um, link in, in, the, uh, in the chat for people to take a look at. Uh, Bernadette Buckley has an interesting question. Can you see this? Um, two parts. One is the hypothesis about high art. Do we really, can we really talk about high art anymore? And I think both, I, I can't speak for Kim, but I think we're both talking about the idea that high art as it is portrayed or uh, collected or represented by institutional structures, neither of us really believe in the concept of high art. Uh, you know, I, probably the same as you, Bernadette. Uh, the second part of the question though is, can art activism really produce change? And, and this is her students asking, and it's a very fair and difficult question to answer. Kim, you wanna take a shot at it? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think that, you know, um, yeah, that is a very difficult question to answer. And I think that, um, I think that yes is the answer in the sense, it depends on kind of what level of, of change we're, we're talking about. You know, um, the, the amazing thing about kind of many of the kind of art activist kind of groups that we've, you know, that, that Greg has kind of just discussed and, and, and there's so many that it's difficult to represent even because, you know, maybe the kind of archives, they don't exist in the archive very, very kind of prominently is that of course they did uh, change things within their own kind of immediate kind of field of kind of engagement which was kind of on in in a specific kind of space and time in a particular kind of place they acted as kind of rallying points for kind of various kind of diverse kind of political kind of questions and so on so so this so you can say kind of an affirmative big yes to that on one level whether that adds up those kind of local kind of um those local kind of forms of kind of emancipation and forms of of kind of resistance add up to kind of wider social change is the kind of million dollar kind of question and one that what that kind of political you know radical politics is always kind of grappling with how do you kind of scale up you know and and sometimes it happens um that that, it, that, that you know as we were just discussing in relation to kind of black lives matter you know you get these moments where where kind of a uh, powerful kind of collective kind of um movement kind of does coalesce uh, uh you know from these kinds of these kinds of smaller more local kind of um engagements um but it's hard to predict how they're going to happen and also very often you will also of course get a counter a counter movement you know that will actually try and kind of push back against that especially in a kind of a moment of kind of political uh, upheaval that we now experience just, I know we're almost out of time and I'm just putting in some responses to uh, some possible groups that I consider maybe successful, you know, in a certain sense. Um, and I think the question of, um, you know, instrumentalization is a really complicated one that we, we, we could probably have an entire discussion around. Uh, but I guess we could turn it around and ask, you know, is, is the right any more successful with what they're doing in terms of appropriating and we're using left uh, concepts, you know, um, if it doesn't work on the left then it doesn't really work on the right either, it seems to me, uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's, that's an incorrect way to think about it. What, what, do, you, what do you think? Ken? Well, if I could just jump in there, we are about out of time, um, but um, I mean, the question of the effectiveness of the right in terms of using art um, and, and, you know, I mean, the whole question of, uh, aestheticization of politics, politicization of aesthetics and, and all of that is a question that fascinates me. Um, I've always felt that it was wrong to, to um, treat um, aestheticizing politics as something that naturally tends towards the right, but I just, I don't know. I, I don't know, Greg, um, about who is more, uh, you know, I mean, if you go back and look at history, who's been more effective in, in harnessing art as a, as, a, as a way of really not just, um, not just spreading a political message, but actually of organizing the, um, um, uh, the political discussion uh, itself and, and politics is something that I, I think is a really important question. And I hope that we have time to, to talk about that a lot more than we have now. Um, we are already over time, and uh, I have to respect people's uh, uh, schedules. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to. To uh, I don't want to have the last word there with that, um, but um, I think we do have to 
close for today, I want to remind you both, um, Kim, I haven't even mentioned this to you, but really the goal here is um, that um, hopefully uh, in the fall of uh, next year to have a, a large international conference um, um, and an exhibition around this um, that um, that hopefully we can have some some much deeper conversations um, and more sustained conversation around all of these issues. But